Uh, so anyway, the, uh, participated in that meant one of the many, two of the many programs uh, that Denver Audubon does, the beginning uh, class that Hugh and Erling teach. And then I uh, was lucky enough to be able to participate in the Master Burger class. So um, anyway, I'm today, you will not be able to tell that I'm a Master Burger. Actually, you probably can't tell if you were to bird with me. But anyway, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you about the great backyard bird count and how to participate. It's kind of cool, it's global. So originally it started out uh, just Canada and um, US. And then uh, in, I think it was uh, 2013, it went uh, global all across the uh, world. So um, the US is the number one participant, but surprisingly India is the number two country followed by Canada. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. And then another cool thing is Colombia actually has the most species. So mm -hmm. Go figure. I mean, I'm sure you guys that know your birds would be able to explain that to me about how Colombia has so many species. I guess it would make sense in the in February because everything's gone to migrate and hang out for this for the winter there. Maybe um, anyway. So it's very global uh, for us. It's fe we're, everyone's birding in fe February. Um, so here we are in Colorado. Um, probably not going to have a bazillion species that we find, but that's part of the data they're going to collect. Um, and those, for those of you that are familiar, and I'll try and give you as much information as I can for those of you who are not familiar with eBird. Um, <clears throat> so eBird will collect all this data uh, on the February 12th through 15th for the GBBC. Um, and, you know, you'll be able to follow, uh, we'll be reporting from backyards, patios, city streets, parks, nature center, wherever you want on those days, wherever you are. Um, and that will all be uh, included into the data for the GBBC. And they will be able to look at that, uh, thanks, um, over time uh, to kind of see how the long-term changes, uh, any trends that they might be able to see. Uh, the whole concept with eBird is the citizen science. There's a lot of data that can be mind out of there but any of you that are actual you know science bench scientists know that you know there's no there's no controls there's no uh you know it's not uh physics or something where it's got to be totally precise this is this is people counting counting birds as best they can in in the setting they're in um so but in the big picture, with all the more people that participate, the more accurate the data actually will, will be and over the longer term. So, um, and you'll also f find that it's just gonna be fun on an individual basis in, in addition to the global basis, you know, you'll be able to say, well, my first one was in 2021 uh, and here I am, you know, in 2035, I'm still counting the birds in uh, like at Bar Lake. That's one of my favorite places. And, and you know, yeah, in 2021, there were 4,000 Canadian geese, and and sadly, in 2035, there's 8,000 Canadian geese, or or whatever, or whatever. So you know, you'll uh, you'll be able to see, th you know, things that 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 uh, of interest to you, because you might be thinking in 2035, oh, you know, they're all there are always so many darn geese, and then you look back and you're like, oh, it wasn't actually that bad in 2021. But anyway, uh, so we learn. Uh, we won't, eBird teaches us about migration patterns. Um, for those of you who are new to it, you can actually go into eBird and learn about migration patterns. Um, you can go, like I was uh, interested in seeing a particular bird in Florida when I was heading down there. And so I went to go look and make sure I would be able to see that bird. And I found out that no, if I'm going in November, there's no way I'm gonna see that bird in Florida. I have to be there in May. Um, so you'll be able to, or you it's really helpful for that. And um, the GBBC won't be necessarily helpful for that because February is not a peak migration time, but um, the GBBC will be able to definitely show us year to year changes uh, and long-term trends. And the big, biggest, coolest part of this is the, the global uh, aspect because it's uh, all, all over the globe. Not quite every country yet, but, uh, dozens and dozens of countries participate. Uh, so what do you have to do? So it's the count part is actually not that hard. For some of you, the big deal is gonna make sure you have the apps loaded. 
Um, but what you need to do is count birds for at least 15 minutes. So minimum. And you can count longer if you want. Um, you need to keep track of the time. Um, and then you need to give the best estimate on the number of individuals for each species of bird, uh, observed. And so uh, for those of you that are new to eBird, um, uh, Susie will send a link after we're done to a free uh, um, webinar type thing on how to um, use eBird. And uh, within that, there's also a best estimate on counting, but I'm gonna review some of the counting essentials for uh, when you're counting birds that you don't, you want a number, you don't wanna use the default X because uh, X means nothing. I mean, X to one person could mean, oh, it's a number more than 20, but X for another person could mean, I only use X if it's more than, if it's in the thousands. So really, if you um, see a ton of birds, try your best to count them. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, you can uh, usually divide up if they're spread across a, a, a field, kind of divide the field in quarters or something, count in the one quarter, multiply by four, or in tenths, count one tenth, multiply by ten, uh, whatever. Um, and then uh, the other thing is like if you're in your backyard and you're you know lock, looking at your feeder for 15 minutes and you know you look at your feeder and there's three house finches and then you kind of scan across the yard and you see a, you know, a cat and then you scan your, you don't count the cat and you can't come back and you see, oh, now there's uh, one finch. It's not three plus one, it's still three because the most you've seen at any time is three. So you just assume the two went away and one stayed. And yes, it's just an assumption, but that's how, we, how they count. And then you keep scanning around and you know, oh, there's a flicker in a tree and oh, there's like three robins. And then you come back and now your feeder and down below your feeder, you see a total of six finches, house finches. That's now your new number because you see six at one time. So you don't do an additive. It's the most you see at one time if you're in one space. Now, if you're on a walk, it's a totally different thing. Uh, but if you're stationary in one place, you kind of have to uh, do the most you see at one time. All right. So anyway, we'll, I'll have questions at the end if you need to review any of that. Um, now, so we're, so here, the Colorado habitat, uh, you know, is what we're going to be using and our yards in particular. And, uh, I don't know if any of you know, Kate, uh, at the, at Denver Audubon, but she's become a, a master, um, habitat person. So she makes her yard. She has a perfect example of a native yard. Um, I have the antithesis of that as in, I go to Home Depot and buy all their stuff and that's what's in my yard almost zero native. So she's uh, inspired me to try to fix that. So we'll see. Um, so how to attract birds to your yard, your backyard, your patio, uh, whatever. Uh, you wanna have food for them. So seeds um, are important. So they, um, and berries. So if you have the shrubs that have like junipers or snowberries or other shrubs that you're gonna find some birds leftover seeds from your garden is, is key. So like if you had, um, uh, uh, if you had like these cone flowers or the blue stem or just these, you know, I don't know what the, the dead stuff was, but that's how my yard looks. So instead of cleaning up your old dead stuff in the fall, um, you just leave it. And the um, leaves kind of are shelter and then the seeds are food. So you know, the flower heads have the seeds in them. And at first couple of years I did that, I was like, oh, this is just so horrible. You know, I felt so unnormal to not clean up my garden in the fall, but now I get it and I love it. And, you know, the birds come and, and eat the seeds all, all winter. And it's so same, I don't have, I need some bushes that have berries. So uh, anyway, anticipation for your next year count to see how much you can improve it by improving your backyard. Uh, you could plant some of these uh, more bird friendly uh, items in your in your backyard, but definitely um, in the fall, don't clean up your garden. Uh, and then you, supplementing with bird feeders is key for the winter. And uh, any of you that have bird feeders know that you're prob you're probably well at least those of us in the 
flat plains of Denver uh, still get, uh, you know, the black capped chickadees and uh, a house finch, some sparrows and some American goldfinch. Um, and hopefully uh, any of you, I'm sure in the foothills or farther south get cool, much cooler stuff than that. Um, once I did get, no, never mind. I don't get anything good. Um, anyway, so backyard birds also, in addition to food, need water. So frozen water, not that helpful. Uh, so if you have a water source, uh, either heat it or have it, you know, mobile, you know, with one of those bubbler things, uh, or just keep um, keep on top of it and refill it uh, daily. Uh, this is a nice slide to practice your counting on. So I'm sure you guys are eyeballing that thinking, okay, I see one, two, three, four European starlings. Um, and then how many robins? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, I think. Um, so one, one hiding in the background behind the starling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> see how hard this is? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, it's, uh, and again, you figure you're gonna miss by one. I was what, under by one, and maybe the next birder uh, will be over by one. Um, and so this looks like typical of, you know, on my backyard is is about a 20 by 20 plot. I am thinking I'm exaggerating actually with 20 by 20. I live in Central Park, uh, the former Stapleton. So, you know, we've, everybody's just got a fenced off little corner of a postage stamp. So, um, it's a miracle that I just have birds coming in, frankly. Um, so shelters are important too. So if you can have a tree or bushes, my brush pile is my, my untidied garden, a uh, covered wooden platform. Hmm, that's a cool idea. So uh, anyway, just, yeah, some shelter so they can dodge this cat from next door or dodge the great horned owl that's flying by or, or, or whatever. So. Yeah, make, make your yard uh, as, as pleasant for the birds for next year. A little late now. Um, anyway, so that would be cool. Uh, let's see. All right. Now, I think we covered this one okay, right? Let's see what we got next. All right. So, oh, here's a fun one to count too. Uh, so in real life, this would be a toughie. I'm just going to look at the pictures with the, cam the canvas backs and the lesser scops. So when you come upon this, this is a, a tough situation to count. So you may, you know, you got your options. You can try it or you can run, <laughs> you know, try it. Uh, but you'll see in here, okay, you got a couple lesser scops. A couple ways to count is you say, all right, well, I got two scops in here out of whatever, one, two, three, four, five, maybe out of 20 birds. So that's like a percentage. And then you can do a count of all the birds you see total and do a big estimate. Okay, I see, you know, 700 ducks in this uh, area. And on average, it's 10% scops. So, you know, 70 scops and 630 canvas backs. That would be a way to count if you saw a big pile like this with some lesser scops mixed in with canvas backs. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, you don't know what I mean on that? And that's what you have to do a lot when you see, um, if you saw Canadian geese and cackling geese mixed in. What I do usually is try and get a sampling of how many are cackling versus Canadian um, in a pretty good representation. And if I see it's like a, you know, a one to three ratio or a one to four ratio, then I'll do the count and then divide them up based on that ratio. Hopefully, if you, and again, if you get questions, ask me in the end. Um, okay, back to the GBBC. So every day that you count between the 12th and the 15th, uh, new checklists on each day, um, a new checklist each location. Uh, if you're just doing your backyard, perfect. You got one location. And if you can do it every day, every that's four different checklists you'll do, that'd be great. You can also do a checklist at the same place, but different times. So you can do you know, a morning checklist in your backyard and then an evening one, or you can do a morning, noon and night That'd be three different uh, checklists. And that'd be kind of cool too, to see, you know, what are your early birds and what are your evening birds and what are your, uh, I don't, you know, what's your bird that sleeps in and just kind of makes a run at the feeder midday. Um, so uh, now for each new location, um, if you're, if you're, some people will, you know, go all around and look at different places 
like they would call hotspots. And you can find that on eBird. That's another thing eBird can do um, is show you cool spots in the area. So you can um, go to the explore function, look under explore and write, you know, write the name of your county. So you can say Adams County, explore, and then it'll, the map of Adams County will come up and they'll have little pins uh, where the, a lot of birding is done and you can figure out where that is, say. Um, so anyway, uh, if you go to different places, then you would start a new checklist at each one. All right, so let's see what we got next. All right, so what you can do, um, all right, so this is gonna shock you, but I can, I'm not very good at chatting and reading or doing the reading chat, but I think there've been two questions and I think I'm gonna save the chat questions to the end if that's all right with you guys. Um, Susie, is that okay with you? Yes, I think that would be good. Okay, thanks. Cause I can, you know, I can barely walk in and chew gum. So um, anyway, so I'll answer the chat questions at the end. So um, now you can do, as I mentioned, you can do it on eBird or Merlin, or you can do it at birdcount.org, which like if I were to rate my favorites, it would go eBird, then Merlin, then add birdcount.org. Um, eBird has the most features and the most things that will la make things more helpful in, as you become a better birder, for example, uh, and it'll answer more questions for you. Like if you did say, oh, I wanna, uh, like if you had some company come in and they said, oh, I wanna go see a bald eagle. You could go into eBird and look, you can either go say bald eagle and they'll tell you where they are, or you could go into right in your neighbor, you know, write your thing, Denver County, and then it'll pop up where, where bald eagles are being seen this week in Denver County. Um, and um, it's got all kinds of features like that. And it may be in Merlin, but I don't think it's as easy to find. Um, so next important, create an account. Okay, so if you're new to the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, you'll need to create an account in eBird, let's say eBird. Um, and then that automatically gives you an account in Merlin, Feeder Watch, Nest Watch, et cetera. And these are all different citizen science programs. I mean, you don't have to do all of them, um, but it just kind of sets up that you'll, you would go in later if you become super into this you could like go into nest watch and participate in that citizen science project and the, your user id and your password would be the same as they were for ebird and, and merlin um, but for the gbbc um, anything you put, put in ebird goes to the gbbc and any saved bird ids in merlin go uh, towards that count and the saved bird ids are like if you go into merlin and you had taken a picture of a bird and you did photo ID and it came up and it said, oh, this is a prairie falcon. And you said, oh, I wanna save that. <clears throat> and you click yes, then they'll send that over to eBird. And so that becomes uh, part of your GBBC. Um, so we got two weeks now, between now and the, the count. So you, you wanna use these two weeks to get your app set up, get registered and ideally maybe do a practice one, okay? Uh, so on Merlin, it's not so much for counting, it's really a lot for more for ID. So you can start bird ID and the first thing they do is have you um, figure out, uh, you know, where, where did you see the bird? And I always just, usually I'm right, and for me, usually, I'm still standing like right in front of the bird. And so it's current location. And then, uh, and then they'll wanna know the size of the bird. And so then they give you these little examples like bigger than a sparrow, between a sparrow and a robin, between a robin and a crow, between a crow and a goose, bigger than a goose, whatever. And then you do next, what was it doing? A feeder, swimming on the ground, in the trees, on a pole, flying, whatever. Um, and then they give you a list of things that it could be. And then when you see what you think it probably is, you say, this is my bird. And then, or you say, can't find it and then if you can't find it, then you go back and adjust your answers, like change the colors a little bit that you saw that you called it. Like, and sometimes that's what the answer is. Cause like a lot of times I'll think <clears throat> something's blue, but it's black or some, I say something's gray, but it's black or something's brown, but it's black, <laughs> whatever. So, uh, you know, go back and make an adjustment or maybe I thought it was Robin size, but it was really more sparrow size like that. 
um, and then that will show up uh, other birds. And these are all birds that are going to be supposed to be in your area at this time of year. So, um, <clears throat> so that's how Merlin works. And then once you, if you click and say, this is my bird, then it will send it over to eBird. If you click the next uh, picture, whatever, the next screen will be, do you want us to send this to eBird? And you'll say, yes, please. And then now here's eBird. Um, so if you, ideally you're gonna start your checklist with eBird and you'll click start a new checklist and it'll show up with, um, you can select a location. It'll often, it'll start with, uh, select location from basically where you are. And that's what I always pick because usually the best way to do it is just keep up with it right where you are. Some people like to enter it in later, but I find it's best to do it as you are sitting or as you are walking, enter it real time so you don't forget stuff. But you can um, select a location, and especially if it's your backyard, they're not gonna have that loaded in there. Um, so you can you know, put your exact little pin on your address and they'll take, you know, that, that backyard will be your location. And then from there, <clears throat> you know, you'll do, ideally, if you're doing it my way, um, you will just pick, you know, today's date and time. Uh, but if you're doing it retroactively, you can change it to, you know, oh, it was this morning, whatever. And then you go through and you say, oh, I saw, um, I guess it will say, go to, the, go to the house, house finches. Okay, four house finches. So you'll, there'll be a little thing, you'll type in house finch, and then you type in the number four and you go, whatever the next thing is, you just type it in and what you saw. And they'll have a list of things that are likely to be seen. And if there's something wacko that you shouldn't have seen, then they'll tell you, they'll put an R there, like this one right here. And they'll be like, uh, I don't think so. But if you're like a really great birder and you're sure that you saw a rarity, then you might want to then if you're a really great birder and you saw a rarity, then you know what to do. You would take a picture, you would write all these descriptions, you would tell all your friends, uh, you know, it would be a big, it would be a big deal. Um, so most likely you'll see likely species uh, and you won't get any of these uh, crazy alerts. You'll, there's possible you'll see a, a semi-rare one uh, when you'll get like a little half colored in circle for those and those are cool. That's like if you see great horned owl because they're not that common. Um, or um, I saw a wild turkey yesterday. That's not that common. So, um, and then um, you can add more details if you want. Like if it was doing something cool, then you can click on adding more things, but you don't need to do that. Like if you saw it, um, if it was like trying to attack you because you thought it, it thought you got too close, you could write that down too. But usually those are comments that um, like during breeding season, you'll have a lot of comments to write because you'll see birds that are like protecting their nest or birds that are building their nest or birds that are feeding their babies or, or whatever, but that's, that's another training. Um, all right, and so this for uh, entering at birdcount.org, I'm not, I'm gonna skip over this because I'm hoping you don't use those. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so after you submit your count, um, well, actually before you submit it, you're gonna review and edit it and make sure you didn't miss anything, make sure your numbers make sense and they seem to be like what you thought they would be. Um, if you're in a group, you know, share your list, you can share the list with others uh, in your group. Um, and so, uh, so if it's a bunch of you, you put all their, your names on that a list and then you submit it and then um, then you can go make another list later that day or the next day or, or whatever. Um, now, uh, one of our participants has nut hatches in his yard. So I'll let in the, both of their yards, I guess. Um, and I think he just said nut hatch. So I'm not sure which kind of nut hatch was in their backyard. So um, if you want, you can unmute and tell me which nut hatch it was of these well, there's actually three types here. Um, but anyway, it's just a kind of a fun uh, practice at identifying uh, some of the birds that you're likely to see. Graham, uh, do we want to take a few of our questions now before we do some bird ID? Oh, that's a great idea. Okay, so let's, all right, now. So let me see the chat. And I can read them to you if you'd like. So oh, I, I, uh, one I, question I was for stationary okay. observations, uh -huh. are multiple observations of the same species appropriate? I, yes, yeah. So you could easily see, um, 
Well, so I guess I should word it differently. So for a stationary observation, um, multiple observations as saying, uh, what I mean by yes, it would be like um, multiple observations and like, yes, I'm sitting here stationary and I saw 47 American Robins. Is that is that what you mean? So, but I um, wouldn't say, oh, the same Robin came three times. The, the question came from Rick. Rick, if you want to unmute yourself and explain, uh, maybe specify your question yeah, a little bit. If, if I'm just making a backyard observation, I've got feeders several places. So if I see, uh, <clears throat> you know, several red breast and nut hatches in one location, and I see several more in another location at around the same time, is it okay to, to have two groups of red breasted yes. nut hatches? Yeah, so if you're if you're pretty sure they did not miraculously fly from one to the other at the same time, absolutely. Count the, the four on this feeder and the six on that feeder at the same time, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great, the next question is- um, I kind of got that. I'm in, I just live in central Denver. Yeah. So I'm a city girl. And Susie, can I layer on to that question real quick? I'm uh -huh. sorry, yeah. Yeah, Shelly, go ahead. So just to clarify, like if I'm doing a stationary count for like for an hour uh -huh. and the finches come and go and whatever, the number I'm gonna put in is the most I ever see at the same time? Right, right, right. right. Yep, yeah. I know. Um, and then, but it's like all over. So in addition, you know, the two feeders or the six feeders and the ground, you know, so for me, I, I get into trouble because I'll have a bunch of, you know, juncos and they'll be on the feeder and they'll be on the ground. And so it's a lot of different places at one time. So, you know, you do your best. And all of this is you do your best. So, um, so and then uh, for Amy's question, yeah, the lake is one question, is one location. So if you were the only, so yeah, that's the, correct. That's one location. So the question was, um, for those of you who don't have chat up, if I go to one of the parks nearby with a lake, does a walk around the lake equal one location? Yeah. And the answer is yes to that. Mm -hmm. And then a bird that you hear but don't see, if you're good enough to know a bird ID from this the, the bird sound, absolutely. Yep, you totally can count birds you hear but don't see. So that would be very rare for me to be able to do, but <laughs> but yeah, you, you can. So and then um, Cheryl, we'll do your question at the very end. Um, so uh, looking at choosing the location information again, we'll do that at the end. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then, okay, cool. So Robert had the, Bob had pig, pig bean nut hatches in his backyard. That's awesome. Lucky you. You probably do not live in central Denver. Oh. Now I shared screen. Did I share the correct screen? Oh, yeah. Sure. Are you seeing the nut hatches? Mm hmm I am. Yeah. So there's the pygmies are um, the far right one and the one on the lower level as well. And then um, the other, we have a red breasted nut hatch here. And then what other, what's this other nut hatch? Yeah, a white breasted. And then over here on the right, there's two chickadees. And I'm, I, in Central Denver, I'm only going to see one of them. Uh, but y'all, those of you in the mount, up in the elevations might see others. Or foothills, probably, too. Uh, and I, I don't know if you guys want to shout out or... A what? shout out or put it in the chat box, either is fine. Oh, yeah. There you go, typing. So the top uh, chickadee is what? Oh, let's see what Mike is saying here. Hang on. He's saying we retune, retune, he, we ret, routinely get red breasted, but last week wow. uh, a pygmy for the had the pygmy for the first time ever. And then wow. guesses on the pictures. We have uh, Morrison sees mountain chickadees routinely. Yeah, and look at that. Celia had a mountain chickadee at Cheeseman. Whoa. Dang. Okay, yeah, so the top one is black capped, which is all over the place. And then the mountain chickadee, apparent, look at that. Celia saw one in Cheeseman, that's crazy. 
That's awesome though. Okay, great. All right, so the next page, what do we got? You guys can type in what we have here. The top left, then the top right and the bottom. Anyone? Pretend I'm Ben Stein, anyone? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, great. Great. Yep, sparrows, exactly. The um, top left is the white crown. And the bottom is the house for sure. And then on the right is um, kind of a tricky one. Uh, it's got this two bicolored uh, beak, I believe they is the word they use. Yep. And then you'll see uh, uh, the top has the red and then there's the eye, the stripe right out of the eye. And then you can't see so well on this one, but I'm, uh, the, there's a little bit of a shoulder patch of red and that's the American tree sparrow. If you saw it in the front, there's a little stick pin or a little dot in the front. Uh, but there, there's, right now there's a ton at the arsenal and a ton at, at uh, uh, Bar, Bar Lake. Um, obviously, <laughs> just letting you know I'm in the north part of Denver. <laughs> so, and then the house sparrow, they're, they're everywhere. Um, and then you get this bonus redness of invasive. <laughs> to scare you. So yeah, American uh, tree sparrow. All right, over here, I think I, oh yeah, I mentioned these guys already. Um, and so just shout, or not shout out, but chat out the basic type of bird. And then if anyone gets to really fancy, they can name the sub, sub uh, description of each one. So. so we have a guess of a wren. We have a guess of a junco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. have more junco guesses. Yep, and then there should be a couple of words in front of Junko. And then um, and then there's some descriptors of, if you get want to get fancy, there's um, like this one with the orange is, is a Junko and this with the black and white is a Junko. You got dark eyed Junkos, right? Um, and then, but these guys have specific names because they look a little bit different from each other, but they're, oh my God, Celia's crushing it. Oregon, gray-headed, slate, and pink-sided. So the pink-sided doesn't look that pink-sided, but yep, the gray-headed, the Oregon is, um, how do, I'm not sure how, I, oh, Oregon orange is how I remember it. And then, so, so, and then the slate is kind of easy because it's just such a gray slate. The pink-sided um, in a different picture would look pinker. They all have a pink nose, so that doesn't help any. Um, but yeah, you're likely to see these guys in February. So, uh, and, and they make a pretty distinctive little sound um, that you that's different from the sparrows. So you could probably get them from the sound as well. Um, let's see what's next. Yeah, a little bit of color. Uh, good chance to see these guys. This may be for those people up in the hills a little bit. Anybody want to chat out what any of those are? Yep, yep, cool. yeah. So this one's the American, left is the American goldfinch and the, yep, the right is the pine siskin, which I still hope I'm right that they're in the mountains because I really don't see them very much myself. Um, and then, um, then on the bottom is one that I don't, let me see, uh, whoops. Yeah, then I only talked about this one all day. So this is the house finch, right? And then, um, yeah, so you might have a red top, red head on the male and you might have it more orangey or, you know, it varies a bit, so cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, and then how many snow geese are there? Anybody get a number? <laughs> See, I'm hilarious, right? <laughs> so anyway, so this is a, a counting challenge. Um, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, the, I think the lesser goldfinch is more a summer thing. I don't think they, we see them over the winter, but that'd be cool if you did. Um, I've only seen the American lately. Um, so, but again, I could 
I'm not really that good, so I could have totally missed them. Um, so this snow geese thing here is kind of a nice example of a, a, a accounting problem in that one, they're flying. <laughs> Very good, on th 333 it is, yep. So they're flying and they're really dense and like you have really no idea. So, um, you know, you could kind of just quick count a big chunk as fast as you could and try and multiply times how many other chunks you think there are is probably the best guess you can do or, you know, and then, and then in eBird, there's a space where you can write comments and you can say, you know, biggest flock of snow geese I've ever seen flying over, not sure of accuracy of 333, but this is the best guess I have. So um, they, they would uh, appreciate, you know, those kind of notes uh, way better than putting an X, um, you know, explain that you're not 100% confident in your number, but you know, this is what you think it is. So then do you want me to address the location part about eBird again? Uh, let's go ahead and just finish up. Finish up and then I'll do that. Are there any other, other questions. general questions? Okay, well, let me go ahead and just share a couple more slides um, and then we will go back over the location information again. So I can go back to that slide and show you. Oh, how about raptors? That's a good question. What, Ellen, if you want to unmute yourself and, and, spet, and give us a little more information about what you are wondering. Oh, sure. I'm wondering about um, counting them, I guess. Uh, I, are, are they a different, a different type of species than what this is intended to count? Oh, no. You still can't count raptors. Absolutely. Okay. It's just we didn't put any examples up of raptors, but yeah. Got it. And then, and, and, you know, the, a lot of times those are the easiest ones because they're so big. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For me, big and sitting on a tree for an hour, I can usually figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Uh -huh. And any other questions? All right, let me just share a couple more slides with you. Um, I want to, again, thank you all for being here in live to learn about the great backyard bird count. I will send an email out. It'll probably be next week when I send an email with links to a couple more resources. Um, so we will, I'll share that with you next week. Uh, as always, we appreciate your support. If you want to learn about more of our programs that are upcoming, we do have an email list that we send out an email once every two weeks. And then you're always welcome to support us financially if you're able to. Um, we certainly appreciate that, any support that you can give us by following us, um, coming to our programs and any other support you might give. Oops, sorry about that. Um, we do have a couple of programs coming up in the next couple of months. We, the only birding walk we are doing right now is walk the wetlands at our nature center at Chatfield State Park. That's the first Sunday of each month. And um, registration is required for that because we are keeping the numbers small for the pandemic. Uh, additionally, we have our conservation series where we're gonna be talking about cats next month, uh, making buildings bird friendly, and pesticides and birds in April. So those will be on our webpage. And we will, of course, share that in our email as well. So thank you all so much for being here. What I am going to do is I am going to um, just stop our recording here.